Welcome to History's Influence. Would the nation of Turkey exist without the man we know as Ataturk? After 700 years of dominance, the Turkish Ottoman Empire had been soundly defeated in World War I. They were forced to sign a humiliating peace treaty, which outlined the partition of their empire and their homeland of Anatolia. But under the guidance of their leader Mustafa Kemal, the Turks successfully defended their homeland and would go on to found the nation of Turkey. This would be followed by a wave of Mustafa's dictatorial reforms, fixating upon secularization and modernization. Mustafa would be granted the title Ataturk, or Father of the Turks, by their parliament. But what if Ataturk never existed? Would his nation's lands be conquered by foreign powers? Would Greece take the great capital of Constantinople? What ripple effects would occur? Would World War II even happen without Ataturk? All these questions and more will be answered in this alternate history. Ataturk was born simply as Mustafa in 1881. He was born in the Ottoman-controlled city of Thessalonica in modern Greece. He was a child of low-class parents, most likely of Turkish origin. He was later granted the name Kemal, meaning perfection, by his mathematics teacher. Four of his siblings would die in childhood. Only Mustafa and a younger sister would survive. In this new timeline, we will assume he isn't born, or doesn't make it past early childhood. Perhaps it'll be from disease like what happened to his siblings. Anyway, by Mustafa's birth in our own timeline, the Ottoman Empire had been dubbed the Sick Man of Europe. They held weak internal control of the empire and were losing lands from encroaching Europeans. The Tanzimat reforms modernized the empire regarding military, law, administration, etc. They aimed to strengthen internal control, which worked, and to strengthen external defense, which failed. The government would fluctuate from constitutionalism to despotism in this period. Mustafa went to one of the new military academies they had made, going on to serve in the military afterwards as a captain. Being recognized for his competency, he would rise in the ranks. However, the Ottomans would continue to face defeats and would lose more and more of their empire. Intellectual and revolutionary movements would also develop in this period, in response to the crisis the empire was facing. Mustafa was an early member of the Young Turks, not the left-wing media outlet, and their Committee of Union and Progress, their front organization. The Young Turks would eventually seize power in 1908, enforcing an electoral system of governance. But after an election loss in 1913, the Young Turks would seize power again, under a powerful triumvirate of political figures. German military officers and other officials became heavily involved in the empire. They were strongly favored by the triumvirate. As a result, the Ottomans would join Germany's side in World War I. Mustafa served as a commander in the war, beating back the Allies in the Battle of Gallipoli. This was the only significant Turkish victory of the war. It was an amphibious invasion launched by the Entente, mainly the British, meant to control the Ottoman Straits. This would split the empire in half and allow for the bombardment of their capital, Constantinople. But without Ataturk, the Battle of Gallipoli will still be a victory for the Turks. The Turks held a strong defensive advantage through heavy trench warfare. The highlands they held made for very defensible terrain as well, causing a tactical stalemate. The Australian and New Zealand Army Corps' disproportionate contribution for the Entente, alongside their horrific experiences, will still be shaping the national identities of New Zealand and Australia. Winston Churchill, Lord of the Admiralty of the time and mastermind of the Gallipoli invasion, will still be disgraced and enter his period outside of politics. During the war, the ruling triumvirate of the Ottomans would go on to orchestrate the genocide of the Christian Armenians, Greeks and Assyrians. Mustafa was not involved, so this won't be changing. He was adamant in denying the events though, which Turkey won't be doing as I'll explain later. After Gallipoli, Mustafa was stationed to numerous locations. He was disappointed in the Turkish army and would later resign. 
He would later spearhead the Turkish resistance in their War of Independence, which I believe will drastically change without his existence. After the Ottoman loss in World War I, the Entente powers of the British, French and Italians would occupy their capital of Constantinople. They were protecting the Ottoman Sultanate as a puppet state, as the Triumvirate had been exiled from power and killed. The Entente seized the key naval straits of the Dardanelles and Bosphorus as international zones. They demanded control of the country's garrisons, and they also ordered the demobilization of the Turkish army. Like the brutal Treaty of Versailles against Germany, or the Treaty of Trianon against Hungary, a similar Treaty of Severus was agreed upon by Constantinople. The Turks would lose their Arabic lands to the British and French. Also, their lands in Europe aside from their capital and large parts of Anatolia were demanded. The Turkish army didn't disband in spite of orders from Constantinople, and resistance would build against the treaty. The Ottoman Sultan Mehmed VI did not want to upset their occupiers though. He ordered Ataturk, a general whose reputation actually improved from the war, to inspect the status of the army, sending him off to Samsun in 1919. Before Ataturk's arrival, the resistance was quite decentralised, organised on a provincial basis, with young Turk members in higher positions. Ataturk would betray Mehmed and join the resistance, rising to its top. He eliminated his opposition, crushed the Islamist faction, unified the groups under his Association for Defense of National Rights, and consolidated the armed forces. Without Ataturk, the resistance movement will not be successful. You won't see someone nearly as effective take the reins without him. Any attempts of resistance won't be formed as quickly or effectively. Ataturk's unique capability and reputation allowed him to cement power and crush his ideological rivals to create the unified revolution he personally desired. The pre-existing army of the Kuvai Milie were a provincial and skirmish-oriented force and would struggle with large-scale conflict. Numerous officers and officials went to support Ataturk from Constantinople. Such leaders are less likely to switch sides without such a strong figurehead to direct them. It would be important to note that the initial resistance was Muslim-oriented rather than Turkish nationalist. In fact, during the Tanzimat period, many reformers were Christians and Jews. Anyway, the Young Turk's broader Islamic framework will be maintained in this new timeline, as opposed to Ataturk's aggressive transition to Turkish nationalism. This would exacerbate disputes, especially given how the Kurds were promised their own state in the Treaty of Severus. But the most important opposition to the Turks came from Greece. The Greeks, despite their financial woes and the split of opinion between king and prime minister, decided to invade the city of Smyrna as they were promised in the Treaty of Severus. This initiated the Greco-Turkish War. This invasion found its origins in the Megaliadia, in which the Greeks wished to restore lands of their former Byzantine Empire and retake their old capital of Constantinople. Such irredentism had roots for centuries but it was bolstered by European-style nationalism. This was a foreign imprint onto both the Orthodox and also later with Islamic peoples, according to Arnold Toynbee. Although I would say both Greece and Turkey have integrated nationalism effectively. Anyway, I believe Turkey will fail to win the Greco-Turkish War in this new timeline. The Greeks were surprised with their initial victories in battle, so they would continue to move into Turkey past Smyrna. It is said the Turkish resistance lacked discipline and experience, having no chance in larger open field battles against the Greeks. In our timeline, the turning point of the war in Turkey's favour was the Battle of Sicardia. Ataturk took personal command in this battle, which won't be happening in the new timeline. Speaking more broadly, Turkey had many more industrial factories for weapons manufacture than the Greeks did. But the Greeks are going to be better able to occupy and therefore use these factories for themselves. Another reason for Greece's failure is that they pushed to reach the resistance's capital of Ankara. But a capital of a resistance may not be established without Ataturk, so the Greeks may choose to solidify their gains without a clear distant goal. Finally, powers such as the British and French won't pull the plug on support this time for the Greeks, since we'll be seeing a more successful Greek offensive. Considering these factors, the Greeks will prevail in this war. They'll be taking a lot more of Western Anatolia than what the Treaty of Severus claimed they would get. 
The Greeks and Turks will do an ethnic population exchange, but this won't be involving the lands taken by other powers. When the Greeks lost the war in our own timeline, the king had to abdicate and flee. This allowed for his son Prince Philip to meet the future Queen Elizabeth II. This means no King Charles III or Prince William, but most importantly, we won't see the train wreck of a marriage between Harry and Meghan. The Greeks' advance would encourage the other powers to pursue their claims on Anatolia. The Italians will acquire their claims surrounding Antalya as they were promised. The French would extend their borders from Syria upwards. The French were unable to beat the Cuvier Millier in our own timeline, so they'd have to send a larger force. The Kurds, who have tensions in Turkey even today, will be given a sovereign state. Portions of British Iraq will vote to join the state, as the British had already agreed upon. The Soviets, who supplied tons of ammunition and gold to the resistance in our timeline, won't be having a solid or successful resistance movement to back. They will instead choose to receive their share of the pie, extending their Armenian state's borders to Woodrow Wilson's initial suggestion. The international zone of the Straits will eventually be abandoned though, likely during the breakout of another large conflict. What would happen to the Turks after this catastrophic defeat? Would they do similar reforms like what Ataturk implemented after the war? The Ottoman Sultan will remain in power, providing a sense of stability within the system. With the neutered resistance movement, a smaller nation, and an ethnically homogenous one, they're going to remain a stable government. The Ottoman Empire, no longer an empire, will likely be renamed Turkey still. They're also going to abandon the title of Caliph, chief ruler of the Islamic world, given their weakness. Their capital will remain in Constantinople, the city being protected by the Entente from Greek expansionism. The city won't be renamed Istanbul, since Ataturk's government won't do so in its modernizing and standardizing efforts. Ataturk's ideology of Kemalism won't be existing in this new timeline, with its starkly secular approach backed by his well-earned and encouraged cult of personality. Kemalism is symbolized by its six arrows. These represent republicanism, folkism, nationalism, laciism, statism, and reformism. This agenda had Ataturk's fingerprints all over it. He pushed Turkey into the direction he desired. Due to his positive reputation, these stark changes were maintained even after his death. The main grain he pushed against would be secularism over Islamic governance. The divide he created is still an issue today. For example, the Hagia Sophia was remade into a mosque in 2023 by President Erdogan, appealing to his religious base over his secularist opposition. The secular reforms also allowed for the creation of modern Turkish pop music, which may not be existing in this new timeline unfortunately. Without Ataturk, Turkey is going to remain a strongly Islamic nation, contributing to stability through tradition. Women's rights won't be prioritized to the same extent without Ataturk's secular streak. He saw no logical explanation in not granting them political rights. Although, the modern Islamic theocracy of Iran does provide a counterexample. Women are highly educated in their nation. Regardless, the hijab will remain prevalent in this new timeline. Polygamy won't be banned, but it was fairly rare. We'll still see civil law marriage however, just for administrative convenience. Other reforms that won't happen would include the introduction of Western styles of dress, the ban of the traditional fez in favor of Western hats, the surname law creating Western style surnames for everyone, including the surname Ataturk, or the Latin script being adopted as opposed to the complicated Arabic script used by the Ottomans. Like the Japanese or Chinese, they're just gonna have to put up with their complicated writing system. Education won't be prioritized as strongly, it was one of Ataturk's primary fixations. But we'll still see basic institutions be adopted, alongside literacy rates increasing, but these may happen slower than what happened in our timeline. The other Islamic nations give examples to what may occur. Speaking more broadly, secular law will also be expanded upon. I'd expect British support in establishing an Islamic constitutional monarchy. It will contain a limited freedom of speech, aside from blasphemy, alongside freedom of assembly and movement. But, freedom of religion won't be implemented for Islamic reasons. Like what happened with the Ottomans beforehand, we'll be seeing a legislative assembly with elected officials. 
Additionally, the power bases of Sharia law, Islamic clerics and such, will reduce the potential for extreme ideologies to arise, such as communism or fascism. It's also going to be a much less militarized society with a stable figurehead, so the common military coups we see in Turkey even today won't be happening in this new timeline. Anyway, some further reasons they wouldn't adopt communism or fascism would include their dismantled resistance army, their substantial reduction in size, population exchanges reducing the incentives to retake lands from Greece, the dominance of the great powers in their region, the fear of the Soviet Union would also delegitimize any communist movement. There's also the fact that there's going to be guilt placed upon them for the Armenian and related genocides. The British will be able to prosecute the ringleaders as they desired to do so in our own timeline. Looking at the economy, the economic troubles of the Great Depression would cause issues in their small estate. Without Ataturk and his implementation of five-year economic plans, among other reforms, Turkey won't be as strongly developed. So Turkey will still become an isolationist state, not joining in on World War II in this new timeline like in our own. Speaking of our own timeline, the Italians were upset about their mutilated peace in World War I, not receiving what they were promised by the Entente after their victory. This would contribute to the rise of fascism in their nation, one of the crucial events that led to the Second World War. But in this new timeline, they would receive a solid portion of Anatolia, helping satiate their expansionist desires. Although in my opinion, Mussolini will still come to power in this post-war period. I believe there are many more factors that help explain his rise, such as Italy's large casualties in World War I, their poor economic situation, their incapable parliamentary government, the violent and unappealing socialist movement, the fascists hiding their extremism and not developing a negative reputation yet. The fascists' march on Rome will still occur, or some equivalent event. This gave inspiration to a certain Austrian painter, so that figure is still going to be taking power in Germany. We're going to see World War II occur in a mostly similar fashion. Although, Greece's land in Anatolia would weaken them, as they'd have to defend against Italian invasion from two fronts this time. But with Greece's enlarged resources, their defense would also be strengthened, so... I think the shift in power isn't going to change their dynamic much. Italy had an incompetent army during the war. The Germans will still support the Italians as a result. This would mildly delay their Operation Barbarossa, their invasion of the Soviet Union, as what happened in our own timeline. The Germans aren't going to invade or march through Turkey to reach the Soviet oil fields, however. The mountains of Turkey and the Caucasus just won't be suited for their armoured warfare. The outcome of the German and Soviet conflict will therefore remain the same, as no other factors will be changing. The Turks will desire not to get involved in the conflict themselves either. Turkey may join the Allies right at the end of the war, as they did in our timeline, but they're not going to get any compensation for it. The Greeks, who were militarily occupied during the war, will be receiving Italian lands in Anatolia, followed by another population exchange with Turkey regarding the land's inhabitants. Following the war, the US and Soviets will still become global hegemonic rivals. Decolonization will still occur. The French and British will give back Turkey their Turkish lands under US pressure. Turkey will be joining NATO. Despite being more secular in this new timeline, the Turks will still hold a valuable strategic location. This is thanks mainly to the Turkish Straits. Expect Marshall Plan economic assistance, equivalent to the amount given to the Greeks, as it was in our own timeline. We will still see US military bases established in key locations in Turkey, of course. Turning to the Greeks, the Greeks won't try to conquer Constantinople for their Byzantine desires. They would be too devastated from Axis occupation, and they might have to deal with the Communist Revolution, which happened in our own timeline after World War II. Additionally, the US will prevent the Greeks from trying to take Constantinople. They wouldn't want to force Turkey into the Soviet's arms. The US placed missiles in the Turkish city of Izmir to threaten the Soviets in our own timeline. This prompted the Soviets to move missiles to Cuba, starting the Cuban Missile Crisis. Izmir will be the Greek city of Smyrna in this new timeline, but the US will place the missiles there regardless. 
so the Cold War will progress the same. The world will remain relatively similar after the Cold War. Turkey will continue along the internal path we've already outlined. It will be a smaller and less developed nation than in our timeline. I believe Ataturk is worthy of the hero worship he receives. The accomplishments and unique direction he pushed Turkey towards radically altered its fate, both through external defence and internal revolution. He was cold and calculating at times, doing what he had to to seize power. But he was a genuine patriot, outspoken at times to this end, and he was willing to use his many talents to the benefit of his people. He also held a kind-hearted and human side. Take his adoption of 13 youths, or his love of music. However, his most favourable marker would be his passion for ancient history. But his vice of alcoholism, inherited from his father, led to his death of liver disease in 1938. He was 57 years old. He was greatly mourned by the nation he had built, forming Turkey from the ashes of the Ottoman Empire. Turkey would simply have not been the same without him. He truly was a great man of history. And with that, we'll be leaving it there. This has been History's Influence. Thank you for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Catch you later.